Hello and welcome back to day five in our afternoon session, Grid Edge Digital Resiliency. I'm Chris Moyer with Z Prime, and I am joined by a fantastic panel uh, to discuss one of the most important topics that the utility industry faces, and that is how we make sure that as our grid becomes increasingly digital, that we provide a a complete and holistic approach to cybersecurity. Uh, and so I am going to, to, to briefly introduce our panel and then we will get into this fantastic conversation. Um, joining me is Shuli Goodman, the Executive Director at the Linux Foundation Energy uh, for Energy. Shuli, uh, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you, Chris. Uh, and joining us from Clear Result, uh, their, C their Chief Technology Officer, DJ. DJ, thank you so much for, for talking with us. Pleasure. Great. And then finally, Dax Streeter, who is the Director of Cybersecurity at LCRA. Dax, thank you so much for, for making the time to chat with us. Glad to be here. Thanks. Well, as I mentioned at the top, we're going to be talking about cybersecurity, but just before I, I turn this over to, to our, our, our wonderful panel, I, I wanted to editorialize from the Z Prime perspective just ever so briefly. And, and our, our belief is that right now, utilities have for such a long time been excellent stewards of managing reliability, uh, safety, and, and security when it comes to the physical assets that, that, all, that all of you own. Um, and as we increasingly move into this digital grid, digital utility space, an area that Z Prime has done a significant amount of research on, it's going to be increasingly important to think of resiliency, not just in terms of how quickly we can turn the lights back on after a hurricane uh, or after a winter storm outage, but how we are protecting uh, our, our critical uh, operational and uh, and IT assets uh, from nefarious actors that, that would look to do harm in the digital realm. And so with, with that kind of brief introduction in mind, I'd like to turn the, the, this first question over to Shuli and ha actually have all of our panelists take a, take a look at it. Shuli, why is cyber, cybersecurity so essential in the clean energy transition that utilities are focused on right now? That's a really great question. And um, hopefully this will make it really clear. So on planet Earth today, there are probably 50 billion nodes on the internet. When folks think about where we're going with regards to the grid, we're talking about having 11 billion energy devices on the grid. Now, energy is a critical infrastructure. So, you know, with regards to um, the 50 billion nodes on the internet, um, we all know that if the internet got taken down, um, it could disrupt life, it could be very painful, it could cause life and limb injury. Um, but when you're talking about critical infrastructure, having 11 billion nodes um, really suggests that we have to get this right. Um, because uh, that, that is what a distributed energy future looks like. It is based on distributed computing. Well, thank you, Shuli. And, and I'd like to ask that same question, DJ, from, from your perspective, building on what Shuli has just described as, as, as 11 billion nodes, those connected devices, and growing as, as utilities look to this clean energy transition, how, why is cybersecurity so essential to that core mission? Yeah, uh, as Julie said, it's a great question. Before I answer the question, I uh, wanted to give uh, 30 seconds background on clear result and why this is very important for us. Uh, as you all know, I'm the chief uh, digital and technology officer for clear result. And clear result, we are the largest provider for energy efficiency and demand response solutions in North America. And if you don't know what that is, we create and manage demand side management solutions for over 250 utilities. Uh, we are headquartered in Austin, Texas. Uh, keep Austin weird, if you guys don't know. 
<laughs> again, I'm talking uh, to you all from my back cave home office in Austin, Texas, a cloudy day. And again, learning a little bit more about Clear Result, uh, we are the portfolio company for PPG Capital, uh, and more importantly, the Rice Fund of PPG Capital, which is a $2 billion global fund that invests in companies that are committed to achieving measurable, positive, social, and environmental outcomes. So that's, so this energy efficiency, demand side management is one of the core things we do, and we do it because we believe in it. Now, coming back to the energy transition and digital, uh, one of the main shifts in energy transition, uh, we all know is the distributed energy resources and the distributed energy efficiency. And uh, we see uh, every day, uh, smaller power sources, battery sources, solar, a lot of on-site generation that are connected over the internet and providing energy required for the whole, whole world over time. And when you say connected over the internet, again, the main key thing is these are connected over the internet and also interact with a lot of edge devices. A lot of complex um, technology being put together to make these things happen. And as the technology becomes more complex and more connected, it also opens for the chance of vulnerabilities and bad actors coming and taking advantage of that. So as we go with the digital uh, energy transition and digital resilience that makes the transition happen, one of the biggest threats for this is the vulnerabilities that we open if we don't take care of ourselves. So extremely important for us. Well, thank you, DJ. I, I, I really appreciate that. And I also appreciate you making sure to, to, to give a more full introduction and, and I, I make sure that we allow Shuli that opportunity as well. Uh, my, my brief introduction was not sufficient and I, and I appreciate that context. So uh, Dax, as I turn this question over to you and the Lower Colorado River Authority and, and your work, uh, if you wouldn't mind giving that brief introduction and then contextualizing uh, upon uh, what Shuli and DJ have, have said when it comes to the importance of, of why it is so critical to, to put cybersecurity within the, the broader spectrum of uh, the clean energy transition. Sure. So thanks for the uh, transition. Um, a little bit about LCRA. Um, LCRA is a, a public utility uh, based in Austin, Texas. We've got uh, critical infrastructure, not only in the generation space, but also in transmission, as well as water. Um, and there's, of course, cybersecurity concerns and threats and, and opportunities in all those areas. Um, LCRA is a, a, a very uh, old and storied organization. So we're heavily involved and focused on the transition into the, into the new energy space, clean energy, and distributed energy, and those are those bring on a lot of new challenges and, and opportunities. I think specifically to your question, um, the 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 simple the simple answer is in numbers, right? So the 11 billion number that that was thrown out is that's that's 11 billion uh, potential entry points and uh, areas that that we have to take into consideration when we're securing our our critical infrastructure and ensuring that the uh, critical services that those systems either connect to or provide are able to do that reliably. And uh, re in reality, I don't think it's feasible to consider that we can cons that we can adequately secure all 11 billion of those devices. So we have to take a risk-based approach and, and look at uh, the, the most critical components of the energy system as a whole and prioritize our resources to, to figure out where we can provide the most value with the limited uh, capabilities that we have and ensure that those critical for those critical services are up and operational, those critical assets are up and operational and um, look at the, you know, the data and the, and the channels between all those devices and, and focus on those and, and make sure that we've got our, our resources aligned properly. 
Well, thank you, Dax. And before we move on to the, the next question and, and dive deeper into resource alignment and, and specific elements of cybersecurity, I do want to turn it over to, to my friend, Shuli. And if, if you good. wouldn't, yeah, if, if you wouldn't mind giving us a, a little bit I of a background on Linux. I was being efficient. It was like, yeah. okay, you want me to answer the question? So you were great. Um, yes. The LF in LF Energy stands for Linux Foundation Energy. And so LF Energy sits in an ecosystem of 400 of the most important projects, open source projects on the planet, their industrial strength. It's what the internet runs on. It's what telecommunications runs on. It's what the computer on wheels runs on. It's what the financial services run on. And um, it, I, my prediction is that energy will run on it as well because going into the future, um, you know, the transition from uh, um, kind of monolithic applications into microservice type applications is going to drive a revolution in the digitalization of energy. Um, so, you know, I, I think that um, you can go to the website, you can see what we're doing. And, you know, the, the other thing that I would just sort of throw in this that kind of builds on Dax's um, comment, um, I actually think we have to ensure the cybersecurity of every device um, that is an energy device um, that is going to be uh, networked together. And you know, one of the projects that I'm working on standing up right now with some of uh, the largest um, computer and uh, security folks on the planet is something called the Digital Bill of Materials. Um, and I think the implications, because it's a distributed ledger technology, it's a DLT, it is this assumption that in order to facilitate how we imagine the grid is going to work, we have to be able to provide that grid. Sure that when one edge device talks to another edge device and they are, um, you know, they're basically saying, this is who I am and these are the rights and privileges that I have, there has to be a definitive ledger for that. Um, and so uh, we see um, a big movement uh, towards a DLT with regards to um, an inventory of everything um, because one of the problems that we're seeing and I think that the US government is responding to is that there are extraneous devices that are ending up in our big electronics. Um, and there are also uh, you know, millions and billions of chips that are, uh, have no serial number on them and they're ending up in our power system. So we have to clean that up. So I think of this as a 10 year journey. Um, I agree with what you're saying, Dax, from where we're sitting today, how can we actually do that? And so there are multiple steps and some of them are processes and some of them are technologies and some of them are planting the seeds for a massively distributed grid, um, which I think will require some new investments um, in the hardware space to ensure that a device is what the device says it is so that we can have that sort of flexibility. So Linux Foundation, LF Energy, um, go to the website. All right, thank you. Uh, as, as, as you all have done such a really wonderful job explaining the why uh, this is such a critical issue. Uh, I'd like to turn now to some of the challenges and the threats that we face uh, when it comes to cybersecurity. And DJ, could, could you, from your perspective on that customer facing demand response side, uh, energy efficiency side, could, could you delineate some of those biggest threats that you see uh, in, in the utility and energy systems? I think uh, both the other uh, panelists have good points here. One talks about prioritization, the other one talks about let's have everything secure. I think the answer is both, right? So I think we need to prioritize, but we need to make sure everything is secure because we don't know where the threats come from. So going back to the demand side response, uh, if you look at what uh, utilities are doing and the solutions we are providing to the utilities, uh, we are trying to, to make the make individual consumers have the ability to make choices for energy efficiency. And if you want them to make the choices and you want them to have the control, 
you push the compute or the decision making down the edge to the lowest or the end the endpoint as 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 much as possible as you do that there are a lot of more endpoints which are intelligent like your thermostats your air conditioners your dishwashers uh, that are more intelligent and actually collect data and provide data back to the utilities and help advise the consumer to make the choices for energy efficiency now you see this connected world where previously the only thing the energy your utility company knew about you was your meter reading and whether you paid your money or not now they know more about you they more they know more about what your house temperature is when you are coming to the house when you are leaving the house when you want to turn on your dishwasher how many times you do grocery so many things or when when you turn on your lights because even a lighting is intelligent lighting now right so the all these devices which previously were thought about as as devices which need not be secure or not important to be secure are now actually connected to the grid connected to the to the network so a vulnerability at the lowest point of the lowest common denominator exposes the vulnerability of the whole grid so how do you make that happen how do you now get that get these devices to be more secure connect and talk more efficiently to the network it's very important and that's the reason cyber security digital resilience is is a huge topic now in the industry thank you dj uh dax uh, building on that idea of the 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 chain is only as strong as that weakest link is as as dj alluded to what are some of the biggest threats that you're seeing in regards to cybersecurity and digital resiliency sure yeah i i wanted to i wanted to comment more on uh not only on dj's but also uh further on discussion uh shilly and our having um as far as as far as uh the need to secure all the all the devices that participate in the in the uh, energy system. The need is there, I guess, to provide more context. I think the change that that has to happen for us to be effective is the way that we are securing the the devices today as to how we are going to have to secure them in the future to be effective. And the methods that we're using today uh, aren't scalable, right? Um, the methods that we have today in place for a lot of our systems provide robust amounts of information on the state of the system. Uh, any, anything from endpoint security to network analysis to um, data tracking, all of these things that, that if you have the resources available in your organization, you can apply. But those types of uh, systems aren't scalable for IoT and for the millions of devices that are going to be deployed into the future. Um, I, I completely agree that the weakness, one of the major vulnerabilities, threats that we have to address is the supply chain and the, the hardware integrity of the systems that, that are being applied to the, to the energy systems. And a concept of a, of a bill of materials and a way to backtrack and have uh, accountability and traceability for all those systems is, is paramount. And um, that's that's one key method that we'll have to put in place to effectively secure devices in the future that we don't have today. Um, and that'll be kind of a paramount shift, right? And, and what we currently have today is some level of trust that if we buy from certain vendors, that that equipment has been vetted and secured. And then we focus on monitoring uh, status and, and ensuring the steady state of that equipment once it once it goes into operation. And that, that, um, that's going to have to change. We're going to have to figure out a way to, to ensure that the equipment, whatever it is, hardware or software, once it's applied, that it's, that it's secure. And then at that point, we're not going to have a lot of ability to make changes to, those, to that uh, equipment once it's in, once it's in the, the system because of the, the sheer magnitude of the, and the distribution of it. So I think that's... I think that's a threat that we're, we're gonna have to manage going forward. And then maybe a more macro statement around how, how we could, how you could uh, perspective on how you can look at that is uh, today, the current energy uh, grid is, is um, it's a mix. We've got the, 
we've got the old line um, steady state uh, reliable fossil fuel systems that have been in place for for decades um, we rely heavily on isolation and heavy segmentation to protect those um, and and that merging of that legacy technology with um, analysis uh, monitoring um, engineering capabilities from our enterprise technology systems is opening up those those uh, vulnerabilities of the IT systems to the OT systems. That's a challenge that we've been fighting for the last five to 10 years. Um, it's being exponentially compounded now as we move into the uh, clean energy, uh, distributed energy space, uh, because now we have the same technology uh, centric vulnerabilities that are being exposed between the the convergence of the business technology in the OT space being converged again and exponentially grown by the, the proliferation of the, the smart meters, IoT devices, and, and other types of energy storage and, and generation systems. So that's, that's, a, that's a challenge that we're gonna have to face. And uh, you know, we've got some ideas on, on that are how we can, how we can address them uh, that are being implied today. And then there's, there's some others that we're gonna have to collaborate on to develop in the future. Oh, that's a great point, and and I and I we will come back to that as as we look to the future. Uh, Shuli, as 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 we continue to to identify some of those those critical cybersecurity threats, is there anything that you would add to to what Dax and DJ have already laid out? Yeah, I'm writing down because uh, you know it's a great conversation. So, <clears throat> um, I I think. Um, that to some extent um, that the conversation really is predicated on what you believe the mental model of the grid of the future is. And that, you know, that we are constantly in a conversation to build agreement about that mental model. And DJ is off in one world, uh, you know, kind of has one view and Dax has another view. And then, you know, the Linux Foundation has another view. And so that's why these forums are so really important because I think that we, I think that we can really begin to build a conversation about something. So my first premise about the conversation about cybersecurity is that we are that part of the epic revolution that's happening in energy is that we are transitioning to software defined infrastructure. And that software defined infrastructure, like you know, what happened with the internet what's happened with telecommunications, what's happening with automobiles, that those things actually require a new way of thinking about software. <clears throat> so, so the next thing then becomes, if in fact we, are, and I, I believe we're building software defined infrastructure, so I'll just take you along my, my little logic journey. Um, the next thing then becomes, um, we really have to have a conversation about how software is cr created and composed. And in the past, historically, I was on another panel this morning and it was so clear that the energy folks really, um, I'm not saying this is everyone, but there is an unequal understanding about how modern software is composed. And so there is a belief that there is proprietary and then there's open source, not that in any proprietary stack, you might have anywhere from 20 to 80% of that stack is open source. So um, the, the problem with black boxes and um, how software is created and composed is the difficulty that a utility has or an end user has in knowing what is inside and whether that software is being updated properly. So part of what happens when you have open source as the ecosystem around which that software defined infrastructure is built, part of what's important about that is the visibility that the developers have into the software and that you cannot have somebody come in and just drop code into it. And you have a crew of people anywhere from, you know, five to 10 to thousands of people who are contributing to ensuring that vulnerabilities are being identified and updated and that those updates are being pushed out. Unfortunately, I've had too many conversations with utilities that describe how 
you know, they're using like Netscape five or something um, in, you know, they're using some really old or internet explorer, like, you know, ages ago, um, because if they were to actually update parts of their system, everything would break. So part of this transition around software-defined infrastructure is moving to a cloud-native approach to building software, so that that software is composable and that you, you don't have a threat because there is one piece that hasn't been updated for 10 years. Um, so I think that's one part of the problem. Um, the, you know, the other part, which I think, you know, is an interesting conversation and Dax, I would, I would be really open to, you know, pursuing it is, um, you know, are we, so in the past, uh, you know, um, a utility would buy a piece of hardware and with the assumption that it would last for 20 to 30 to 40 to 50 years, um, and that there was a kind of rigidity in terms of flexible that investment is. And I would propose that the cusp of the revolution we're on is that we're looking more at massively flexible and configurable and composable and that we are never going to know actually what the end state of the grid looks like. We just have to plan for this kind of, um, kind of like the internet where you know, nobody really knows where it begins and ends and kind of like the universe, we don't really know where it begins and ends. Um, and that, you know, that we have to really decide, are we going to come up with a Google version of, of software security or are we going to come up with a black box version of cybersecurity? And I would, I would say it really has to be the formal former because we will be managing an infinite amount of nodes and I have no idea of 11 billion is even accurate. It could be way more than that if you start to add in automobiles and other kinds of batteries and the stuff that DJ is managing, which is behind the meter. And I believe that increasingly those devices are going to become, you know, arbitra arbitraged um, as part of how we compose the grid. Well, I, Shuli, I want to come right back to you, but uh, uh, DJ, I think that that might be a good opportunity for you to actually uh, come into the conversation. And, and, and we're going off script here, folks, but uh, as, as we talk about arbitrage, okay. uh, yeah. you know, uh, what, what would you say in, re in response to, to that opportunity? I, I think that that's certainly something that, that clear result, it might be or is interested in. Yeah, absolutely. So I think uh, I'm uh, uh, virtually on the conversation about software defined infrastructure. I think I feel the conversation for that has ended 10 years back. We are doing software defined infrastructure. There's no questions about it. And that's the, that's the way of the future. And also the conversation did end a uh, long time back whether people need to be cloud native or not. And I think cloud native is a part of life, right? Uh, whether that cloud is a public cloud, a private cloud, a hybrid cloud, however you want to look at it. I think the conversation where I, we are going right now with how the world is getting connected is where the compute is actually happening and where the decisions are being made. And, and traditionally, we thought big power, a lot of CPU, a lot of compute, let's put it in one place. Everybody talks to that mothership which makes all the decisions and gives back the responses for people or the devices downstream to do whatever they need to do. With the, with the advent of uh, uh, cheaper compute, the decision making is actually now being layered in and pushed as close to as possible sometimes to the end result, right? So that's the, that is the new, new realm we are in. When you look at AI, when you look at ML, and all the models we are trying to build, we have a central place to build the models and the edge place to push the models, right? And how do you actually now execute those models on the edge and, and execute them in such a way that it's secure? And that's where the conversation is and how deep do you want to go into the network? So I think the conversation that, that, that Shuli and I think Dax are having is, it's not about software-defined infrastructure, it's not about cloud-native, it's about 
the, the, the depth at which the distance will be made. And at some point, if we assume that the individual washer and dryer is going to make a decision on how you should wash your clothes, we should also make sure that it's secure enough that it actually is making the right choices because the washer and dryer probably doesn't come with all kinds of infrastructure security around it. But how do we do that now, right? Or if you want to a power plant, a motor in a power plant, which can be connected to the internet to make its own choice to shut down water when a nuclear power plant is in a bad state, do we have enough infrastructure to say that that motor can make the right choice and nobody else can hack into that motor and make it behave differently? I think that's where the conversation is right now. Hopefully that makes sense. It, 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 makes, it makes perfect sense, DJ, and thank you for contextualizing that and responding to, to Shuli's point. I mean, obviously that that nightmare scenario of uh, a, a 95 degree day in, in California and uh, an actor, a nefarious actor turning on uh, 15 million washing machines at the same time, at the same time as, as, as you know, turning everybody's thermostat down five degrees, that's, that's gonna have catastrophic uh, impact on, on the grid. And, and, I, and, and I, that is hopefully hyperbolic from my perspective, and and I'm gonna you know step back and, and let the true cybersecurity experts uh, re-engage in this conversation. But surely, as as we've talked about, as you've talked about these these 11 billion devices as we as it stands right now, roughly, uh, and a, a growing number of electric vehicles and distributed energy resources and all of these behind the meter uh, devices. Uh, you know how uh, how do we manage the scale of securing so many different devices? So I, I think it's at many different. It's really at many different levels. But you know, one of the things you said, DJ, was um, actually was an assumption that I would push back on a little bit, which is that um, that the devices that we actually plug in in two years, five years, or 10 years, will not have that kind of IoT capacity to arbitrage. And, uh, you know, for me, why I put uh, LF Energy, like, I went to LF, I went to the Linux Foundation and said, I want to do this, because all of the components of the grid of the future exist there. So if you go to the um, Bosch's and the Fujitsu's and the Mitsubishi's and the Hitachi's and the Samsung's and the LG's, they're all at the Linux Foundation. So the leap really becomes when they recognize that they have a horse in this race and that it's not just about quote unquote energy efficiency, but it's about their p a, a capacity to really uh, wholesale, um, you know, um, participate in what I think are the real currency markets, you know, and so so there's so there's that, and I figure, look, if they're all using uh, some part of the Linux kernel or embedded Linux in their systems, which they all are, then the next part is that we jump into those working groups and we begin to actually direct the kinds of drivers that are coming out for this equipment so that it actually enables that. So that's futuristic, I get it, it's not tomorrow, um, but, but I would want you to hold the possibility that that will exist one day um, and that it's a kind of a no brainer once we actually really begin to get our momentum. Um, so, um, gosh, Chris, I totally lost the question, which are what are some of the biggest threats to cybersecurity and digital resilience? Well, it, 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 and really, as, as, as you've touched on that, sort of, and, I, and I appreciate that response, but, but sort of, how do we manage this scale? And I, I don't think you've lost the threat at all, Shuli. Okay, so from a scaling perspective, um, so this is, you know, my background was in enterprise information management, and then I went and I got a PhD, which is, you know, not necessarily intuitive. Um, but the area that I did it on was really around the adoption and diffusion of innovation. So I think a lot about scaling and how do you actually push systems to scale and kind of remove the obstacles for scaling. 
So, you know, we, we have a very steep diffusion curve and there's going, once we actually begin to get on that pathway um, in, in great earnest, um, there's going to be a tremendous amount of momentum and software is really the only way that we can abstract the complexity of this problem um, so that we can have scaling. And once you do it, it's cheap. You know, it's, it's not, um, it, it's cheap. It, it, the cost of it goes lower and lower and lower and lower. Um, and so I, I, I think that, you know, that's, that's how I think it's going to work and that, um, that the key will be and uh, is the governance, which is the governance of the software and the, the kind of features and, you know, at, at the Linux Foundation, we go by this scratch your own itch. Um, which is nobody goes out and says, you need to work on this and you need to work on this. You have a code base and people begin building out the features and functionality that they need to use with this notion of 80% open source and 20% proprietary. That's how I think we're going to scale. I, 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 don't see, I honestly can't see another way that this is going to happen fast enough um, that, that we're going, you know, proprietary has gotten us to this point where we have a good proof of concept, but now we need to go the next distance. And, and if you don't believe that this is going to happen, then think about all those internet companies that don't exist anymore um, because they held on way too long to a proprietary model. And, and that, you know, to Microsoft's credit, what has enabled them to really re-enter at magnitude into the world technology scene is that they are all in on open source. And, um, and the same thing with IBM. So, you know, it's really, we, there has to be a pull from the utility side um, that says, this is the direction we're going in. And so I think a lot of what I do right now is education and recognizing we've got this window and you know, if this is what one percent at one degree looks like, I really don't want to go to two degrees because um, I will absolutely unequivocally be a climate refugee, and I don't I don't want to join those ranks. Um, I want us to solve this problem. I think it's doable, and I think it's good for the world, not just because of the pollution that we're you know and the carbon, um, because, but because and this gets to DK, DJ's point as well, which is. Um, radical energy efficiency is the direction that we're going in. We, you know, no other commodity on the planet has been managed on some level so poorly where we have allowed um, as many electrons to get lost in the process. Um, and we need to like really change the paradigm where radical energy efficiency and that every electron is being used as absolutely efficiently as possible that's the world that I see emerging. And so I am really glad to meet DJ and to hear what he's doing because it's part of that. It, that and uh, create local, consume local. That's the other way that actually, um, you know, and, and to begin thinking about our relationship um, to DC and not just AC, um, up, you know, because I think DC is more efficient probably. Well, surely, thank you for 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 that. Uh, it, truly, I, I think uh, it, it was a tough question. And and talking about scale, you have to go to a lot of different places. I want to bring Dax back into this conversation and and talk a little bit about the process and when utilities sit down and they think about all of the the uh, the grid assets that are owned. Uh, this is another problem of scale. Can you expand on your comments earlier about collaboration between business units and the cybersecurity team in protecting critical infrastructure? Sure. Thanks, Chris. Um, I'll touch on that briefly by talking through how the cyber functions evolved at LCRA, and then I'll talk about you know, how we're, where we're planning to go in the future to focus on digital resilience and ensuring the resilience, long-term availability and reliability of, of the services that we provide. So as, as cybersecurity evolved at, at uh, LCRA, um, we identified early on that it was 
the cyber is becoming a major risk to the to our line of business. So we we gathered up all the resources at, at the company that were providing cyber type services. They were dispersed throughout the organization, put them in an independent team and created a, a chief information security officer. And that gave us the visibility with leadership that was that cybersecurity needed to address the risk that we were facing. Um, as that was a great move uh, organizationally. It addressed any um, issues for conflicts of interest that would potentially occur if cyber resided in, in, a, in another, another department. And it, it, uh, it gave cybersecurity a way to influence the business and provide services that the, that the lines of business needed. We then included uh, risk as uh, a function that, that uh, cybersecurity could feed information into. So we merged our enterprise risk group with cybersecurity and created a chief security and risk officer position that led both groups. We also combined our physical security team within, those, within that organization and converged physical and cyber uh, focuses as well as information sharing on, on threats that we had seen. That, that bolstered up our ability to identify and protect both on the physical side and the cyber side are our critical assets. And then feed into the enterprise risk team, which in, in turn informed our leaders to, to make risk-based decisions. And then as of late, uh, we've, we brought in the um, employee safety team. We made a larger group, which we call resilience. Uh, and, and that group now is comprised of cybersecurity, physical security, and, and employee safety. And that, that uh, new organizational shift is really in line us for where we're going in the future. Um, anyone that, that's, that's worked at the utility understands the paramount focus on safety and the, the constant drive to instill a strong safety culture within the organization. Uh, that, that empowers employees to walk into any scenario, identify uh, any potential safety issues, um, address them, and if they can't be addressed, to, to stop work. And with, with an uh, entire focus on protecting the safety of everybody involved. And we want to instill that same concept from a from a cyber security perspective to, to establish what we call a, a, a cyber culture, right? And we believe that that's necessary because as the threats to our not only our assets, but our customers' assets, uh, services, and the unidentified vulnerabilities that may arise day to day, working through with new vendors. Everyone that's involved uh, has to, not just the cybersecurity team, but everyone that's involved has to have a perspective that um, there may be cyber issues that, that they can address, uh, identify, and, and then mitigate. And in order to do that, you have to have that, that mindset established in your in your day-to-day -day operations and we believe that we're going to have to focus on that going forward from a all across the board employee perspective to to bolster up our resilience and on the risk side um, we're we're focused on collaboration the idea of cybersecurity, uh, doing assessments identifying risks and providing that information to our customers are vendors, our lines of business, and then checking back in for possible mitigation status is, is, not, is not effective. The way that we have to identify, effectively identify risks and mitigate them is, is to work together, understand specifically the technology that, that our different lines of business are, are utilizing, that our vendors are utilizing and proposing, and um, collaborate with all resources involved to effectively identify risks, and then most importantly, figure out collaboratively solutions to, to minimize them. We'll never remove them, but how we can minimize them and mitigate them uh, to the level needed to, to maintain resilience and, and long-term availability of our, of our services. Keep the lights on. Well, keeping the lights on is in, ingrained and safety is ingrained in, in utility culture. And I'm so glad that you also mentioned that idea of the culture of cybersecurity too, uh, because it, it's only when, when there is that, that cultural awareness that it can expand beyond folks like yourselves that, that eat, sleep, breathe uh, this, this, this type of important cybersecurity work that it can become fully ingrained in the business. Uh, time has just flown by. And, and so 
I, I do want to thank all of our panelists, but I want to give DJ the, the last word on this. And, and we do have a question in from the audience uh, that I think you will be able to particularly speak to. And, and you can wrap it in, in this idea of, uh, you know, as we look at, does read only access from behind the meter devices ensure enough separation from critical energy delivery systems while also providing revenue grade data that is accurate for transactive energy platforms or pay to play performance programs. Uh, the, the questioner is asking about uh, home area networks on AMI metering that thus far his, his premise is that, and I, and I think we agree at Z prime that they have been underutilized and, and then tie that into overall uh, opportunities for cybersecurity and customer engagement. It's a lot, but yeah. uh, hope, I'm sure you're up to the challenge. So I think, uh, 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 the concept that uh, if we uh, restrict the permissions and privileges, right? If you say that you might only have a read-only access or sometimes a, a read-write access based upon what the device needs to do or wants to do, or what, what the device is capable of doing, I think that's a great way of mitigating some of the risks, right? So absolutely. But at the same time, uh, one of the things I always tell people about security, right? So you can make your house really, really, really secure. Close all the doors, never open them, and it will be really secure, right? But at the same time, it becomes also extremely unusable, right? So how do you balance this usability and 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 actually innovate and take advantage of all these things? At the same time, how do you make sure they are secure, right? So that is the the line we need to walk. Uh, we, we can quickly uh, uh, kill innovation by, by a lot of uh, uh, locks on the door, right? So, so there, is a, there, is a, there is a fine walk there. At the same time, if you look at uh, cyber security, uh, and sometimes it's a black box <clears throat> for a lot of people. And, and because we as a community has done, we have done a poor job of educating people on cyber security. We do a great job of educating people on safety. Energy companies spend a lot of time in safety resources and, and, and educating the community on safety. But are we doing a really good job of educating the end users on cybersecurity? Are we giving them use cases? Are we teaching them how to use their devices? Are we spending enough training to train them to make sure that they can be secure, right? At the end of the day, again, as uh, Shelly was, Shelly was talking about, if you engage the community, right, and make them look at things together, you solve the problems, you make it more secure. We are doing it at a software level, but we're not really doing it at, at the cybersecurity practice level. So how do, you, how do you move this to the practice level to involve, the, involve not just the developers and the geeks, but the community as a whole and make the whole environment secure? I think that's the biggest challenge we have. Well, DJ, uh, thank you for, for putting a bow on, on this fantastic conversation. Obviously, as I said, we, we could, there are so many different avenues and pathways that we can explore. Uh, and, and I appreciate each one of you taking the time to discuss digital resiliency, cybersecurity, the, how we build uh, that open source network. Shuli, thank you so much for, for your comments today. Thank you, Chris. Thank you all. Okay. It's been a pleasure uh, doing this with you. These are important conversations. So thanks sure for the time. Thank, thank yes. you. Okay. Yeah, Jax, thank, thank you so much for sharing your perspective at LCRA. Absolutely. Enjoy the conversation. Thank you, Chris. My pleasure. And, and DJ, uh, really appreciate your comments uh, it, and, and the clear result perspective on how we make sure that we're we're really focused on the customer as well.